Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends and viewers, uh, today my guest is uh, Mr. Stephen Kotler. And Stephen is known for his fantastic books. He's written, I think, uh, 13 uh, books to date. 11 of them are New York Times best-selling um, you know, books and he's a best-selling author. And in some uh, kind of definition of, of, of you, it was said that uh, neuroscience author, neuroscience because you are touching quite a lot in most of your books in this area of neuroscience you award-winning journalist and uh, you are uh, a director of flow uh, flow research um, collectives i think that's what the correct name uh, today we would like to talk i would like to talk i mean my problem is that there are so many issues i would like to talk about and the issues uh, ranging from high performance and Steve uh, is the uh, leading expert, world leading expert on high performance. Uh, that area of, uh, of um, you know, extremely interested to my, to my viewers. And at the same time, your latest books, which you've written with um, uh, Peter Diamandis on the future, such books as Bold and, and uh, Abandons and Future is Near Than, uh, than We Think. Uh, absolutely fantastic books and I'd like to talk about that if, if possible if we have time but let me start with a maybe trivial question uh, but important for my viewers uh, what is the flow because you are referring to that state of, of mind and state of uh, human um, very very often so what is the flow yeah flows at the center of the work we do at the flow research collective um, and where we, what we study is the, is the neurobiology of peak human performance, right? What's going on in the brain and the body when we're performing at our best. And flow is how human beings are designed to perform their best. Different people use all kinds of different terms for flow. Flow is a technical scientific term. We can talk about what it means. Sometimes people call it runner's high or being in the zone. If you play basketball, they, they call it being unconscious. Stand up comics will talk about it as the forever box. Abraham Maslow, the, the famous psychologist, talked about his peak experiences. So the lingo goes on and on, but the term is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness, a state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. And more specifically, everybody's familiar with this experience. It's those moments of rapt attention and total absorption when you get so focused on what you're doing on the task at hand, everything else just seems to disappear. Right? Your sense of self will get really quiet. Time will pass strangely. It'll speed up. Five hours will go by in like five minutes. Sometimes it'll slow down. And you get that freeze frame effect. Maybe then you've been in a car crash. And throughout all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. Interesting. That what do you think that most of the people uh, one time or another experience that flow? Or it's something which is... Uh not that universally sort of uh... no it's a so it's a great question it is universal one of the some of the earliest things flow science is very old it dates back to the 1870s by the 1970s we knew for example flow is universal shows up in anyone anywhere provided certain initial conditions are met so everybody listening to this can get into flow uh, it shows up in all colors all classes all races Everywhere you could possibly imagine, they've, they've found it. And um, actually, there's a, so one of the things, it's, let me back into your question and tell you something else about flow that'll be helpful here, which is when scientists, psychologists define flow, they do it because the state has six core characteristics. These are way flow makes you feel, and I named some of them earlier. This is complete concentration in, a pres in the present moment on the task at hand, the vanishing of self, time dilation, right? There's a couple more, six in total. And so what psychologists do is when they measure an experience, they say, well, how much of these six characteristics showed up at once, right? If all six show up, that's flow. So flow it's not just one experience, it's a spectrum experience. It's like any emotion. So think about anger. You can be a little irked or you could be homicidally murderous. It's the same emotion. So you can be in a state of what's called micro flow. This is when those six characteristics show up, but they're really soft. So this is, 
This is when you sit down to write that quickie email, you look up an hour later and you've written an essay and maybe your whole sense of self hasn't vanished, but you had to go to the bathroom and you don't realize it until you, you sort of pop back and you're like, oh wow, I gotta use the toilet, right? That happens to all of us all the time. That's micro flow. On the other end of the spectrum is macro flow when all five or six of the characters did show up at once. That state is, can be a little rarer um, for people and so strange that um, until the 1950s, a lot of researchers thought it was predominantly a, a so-called mystical experience or spiritual experience or it happened in religious communities. Um, it wasn't until Abraham Maslow uh, discovered, uh, you know, he was studying high achievers, though he doesn't mean success, he really means happiness and, and right, uh, by high achievement. Um, and he found that one of their major commonalities was that they all use flow to kind of reset their brains and help them be creative and do a bunch of other stuff. And everybody in his study group was an atheist. So suddenly spiritual experiences were gone and peak experiences, what we called them next. And then a guy named Miha sent me high, who's the chairman of the University of Chicago Psychology Department and sort of the godfather of flow psychology came along in the seventies and he renamed the state flow. Right. Um, but it's the same experience. So most, to answer your question, what we know is that, for example, most people spend about 5% of their work life in microflow, often without even noticing. 5%. Right. Yeah. Now, I think that that d depends on what job you do and how the company works. Sometimes that can be a lot higher. Um, but on average, this is inside of organizations. Um, they find that most of us will spend about 5% of our, our work life in flow. And I understand it depends on the work you do. I mean, if you sort of work at the assembly line and do something like, you know, manual thing, you know, it's very unlikely you'll be in the flow. Interestingly, and we could talk about why this is, uh, but uh, when Csikszentmihalyi did his original giant flow study, they looked at assembly line workers in both Detroit and Chicago, and they found they could get into flow, which was impressive. And Toyota, when they rebuilt their whole facility and their whole management uh, ideas in the 90s, Kaizen, for right. reasons again, we can talk to Kaizen is, was specifically designed to produce maximum amount of flow in the employees, right? And drive engagement and performance and a whole bunch of other stuff. So you are right. As a general rule, assembly lines suck, but there are <laughs> examples of it, right? Where it really works. And I don't think it's so much about what job you do. It's how you do the job. Some of it is outside stuff. There's, you know, you can build, companies can be designed for flow. Microsoft has been very good at this. Uh, companies like Patagonia, Apple, these companies were designed around flow ideas and they're very good at this stuff. Other companies are not as good. Um, and so it really depends on your organization. Right. How flow connected to love? Mm. Because usually, I, you know, when I'm recording what, when I felt like great, you know, usually, you know, it's, it's love, love is in the air. You know, you feel like, ooh, you feel that everything is, uh, you know, going exactly as you want. And that's, um, is it? Oh. So, when scientists talk about love, they talk about, first of all, you have to split love into two things. There's romantic love when you're falling in love with somebody, and then there's long-term relationships, right? Mm -hmm. and um, there's neurochemicals underneath both. And the neurochemicals that show up under romantic love also show up in flow. Mm -hmm. um, there's more, you get more pleasure chemicals than just what shows up. So flow is, so romantic love, and this is a woman named Helen Fisher's work. She's at Rutgers University in the States, mm -hmm. New York. Romantic love is underpinned by neurochemicals called dopamine and norepinephrine. Flow is dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, anandamide, and endorphins. And if you're with other people and you get into a group flow, social flow situation, you get oxytocin. oxytocin. So long-term bliss, right? Marital is predominantly oxytocin and endorphins, right? Those are, dopamine and norepinephrine is all about wanting and desire. Endorphins and uh, oxytocin is all about what you have already, right? A long-term relationship, right? It's, it's a difference in, and flow actually will give you all of those at once. Interesting. Uh, and, and another thing is like, because you're mentioning this is like state, uh, I don't want to go into something which I don't have much experience, like um, um, Ayasco or some drugs or some, I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, or some spiritual experience, let's say with the, with the voodoo man or something. Is it the same thing? Well, 
understand that that's not work I do a lot of. Um, but uh, yes, and so my first mentor in neuroscience was Dr. Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania, who did early brain imaging work on Tibetan Buddhists and Franciscan nuns when they were an experience uh, called uh, uh, oneness with everything, right? When they felt one with everything, and, and he wanted to know why this was happening. He looked at the, this is something that happens in flow. It's, it can be very specific. So Franciscan nuns, for example, will feel unia mystica, which is oneness with Jesus's love. Right? Really right. Tibetan Buddhists feel absolute unitary being. So in flow, like if you're a surfer, you're going to feel one with the wave that you're surfing. On. In fact, in the Russian language, it's on the wave. You know, the flow. Um, you know, oh, they call it on being on the wave? Is that, oh, that's great. Right. Yeah. On the wave, yeah. What is, one more time in Russian? No, no, no yeah. Got to write it down. Right? I'll put it down. I'll spell it. That's great. Yeah, no, I've been collecting different terms globally for flow. So I, wanna, I definitely want as many as you can give me. Um, I don't remember what you asked me. Well, we asked about the... Um, well, the flow and then the spiritual. Oh, spiritual uh, stuff. Yeah, so. Spiritual so experience. Uh, what we know, so there is a lot of overlap between, if you look in the brain, if you're just talking about neurobiology and, and patterns in the brain, there's a lot of overlap between what I said in, in my book, Stealing the Fire, there's a whole range of experiences that are all north of happiness. Trance states, ex these are the ecstatic states, right? Trance states, flow states. Um, joy is up there, awe is up there, all kinds of like, you know, speaking in tongues experiences, out of body experiences, psychedelic experiences. So all of those experiences share a tremendous amount of common overlap. Um, and I can break it down if you really want to, um, if you want to understand the neuroscience, but there's a lot similar. Psychedelic experiences are, are, are probably the, the most different from flow because they're predominantly serotonin based experiences. And while serotonin is, is present in flow, it only appears maybe at the front end and the tail end of the state. It doesn't seem to be in the center. We could be wrong, we don't really know, but certainly not at the levels you get in like ayahuasca to, to write the, what you mentioned or, or some of those other substances. So there's a lot of overlap neurobiologically and they feel very similarly. Um, and there's been a lot of, there's been great work on this at this point. I mean, I, like, I don't know if you follow this work. So when, when, when my mentor and Andy did those brain imaging studies in 97, six, he was one of the very first. There was another neuroscientist named Walter Freeman in America who was starting to talk to monks. Richie Davidson at the University of Wisconsin was starting to think about doing some of this stuff. But this was really early days. 20 some years later, um, 23 years later, pretty much any mystical, so called mystical experience you could name, we have put the put people inside of brain imaging devices one way or another, and we can find biology underneath it. I always say, you know, if you're if you're spiritually inclined, if you're religiously inclined, the biology doesn't mean anything, it just means that if there's something out there, it talks to us through our biology. Right. If you're an atheist, here's your proof. If you want to believe in something, here's your proof. It doesn't. So this is not about a greater why. It just says, hey, look, these experiences function biologically. There's a couple things we've never found. Maybe it's because our measurement techniques aren't there yet. Maybe it's because it's not there. But as a general rule, um, we've really a lot of the, a lot of this work has been done. Um, and I'm sure, by the way, um, I you know that doesn't even include the work that's been done in Russia, right? Where there's 30 or 40 years of fantastic neuroscience that hasn't really been translated to English. So we don't have a clue, right? Like, well, I just can give you sort of like the, the, the American European perspective on this, knowing, but I, you know, obviously there's a ton of work that was done in your part of the world that I'm unaware of. All right. Interesting that, um for me, flow means, um, I mean, the difference between, let's say, some uh, psychedelic experience is that flow presumes some productive uh, work. I mean, yeah, that's I, can... the, that subs, I agree with you. Some people, that's why I don't do psychedelic work. We did one study with Imperial College in London where we wanted to look at flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. So when we train people, right? What all this neuroscience has taught us is where flow is coming from. So we use these triggers 
and what we know about flow science to train people into the state, right? With psychedelics, as you know, they're set and setting, right? The room you're in, the people you're with, the music, the clothing, all that influences the experience. We wanted to know, is there overlap between set and setting and psychedelic trips and flow states? Where do they overlap? Where, and we, so we did some work on that. And it's interesting, there's some overlap. There's places, right, synesthesia, which happens on psychedelics, never happens in flow, right? The other thing, by the way, nobody ever has a bad time in a flow state. Right, you can have significantly negative experiences in psychedelics. One of the flow is unique among altered states for two reasons. First, because you can never have a bad time in a flow state. Right. Mm -hmm. Second, it is remarkably consistent. A big wave surfer, Laird Hamilton, who's, who's a good friend of mine, who I've done a lot of work with, likes to say, "When you go there, it's always the same. It is, and you are, and that's it." And the first time I heard him say it, I thought he was being like flowery and metaphorical. And then I started to realize he's being absolutely literal. Like this is known among scientists that like, it's remarkable. If you think about every time you dream, you go to a kind of a different dream world, right? It varies a lot. Flow, whenever you go there, it's the same experience. It's remarkably consistent. And then the next question, of course, you know, how to achieve it. For example, you compare a flow with the anger could be a little anger and I can work myself and I know how to do it into like rage, right? And I mean, I start visualizing, start talking to myself, you know, imagining things which never happened, but you know, so I can make myself really, really <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. But uh, with the flow, is it the same? I mean, is it so, so simple that you have triggers and then you can move? Yeah, up, it's, you know? it's, it's unlike emotions flow is actually a cycle so if you think about the creative process you it, it talked about it as, as a four stage cycle for flow is very similar it is also a four stage cycle and um you have to pass through each stage there's different neurobiological changes at each stage you seem to have to pass through most of them to get to the next one so that that's not the case with other altered states. It's different from how we used to think about flow. People used to think about flow as like a light switch. You're either in the zone or you're out of the zone. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, and this is Herbert Benson's work at Harvard that kind of laid the foundation for this. Um, but he realized that he mapped this four stage cycle with different kind of neurobiological changes under each. So um, how would he get more flow? The mo what you really need to understand is the stage of the cycle so you know where you are. It's a map, right? Here's where I am. This is what I have to do to get to the next spot. And right. And then you need to know about this. So there are, I mentioned flow triggers earlier. And there are 22 in total that we know of. There are probably way more. Um, it's really simple to understand what the triggers do. So flow follows focus. It shows up when all of our attention is focused in the right here, right now. So what the triggers do is they drive attention in the present moment. And they do it in one of three ways. They really drive neurochemicals we've been talking about, norepinephrine and dopamine into our system. Those are focusing chemicals. Think about when, or I, think, I said those two together are romantic love. Think about how much attention you're paying to somebody you're falling in love with, right? That's a massive increase in, in excitement and attention. That's what you get from, or these triggers lower cognitive load which is all the crap you're thinking about at any one time, right? And if I lower cognitive load, I liberate more energy, you can use it to pay attention. So that's what these triggers do. Um, they vary. So there's a whole bunch of what dopamine-based triggers. So um, anytime we encounter complexity, novelty, unpredictability, risk, that could be physical risk or psychological or emotional um, risk, uh, pattern recognition, when you link ideas together, all those things trigger dopamine and all of them will trigger flow. So I'll give you a simple example from one way. I have to read a lot of neuroscience textbooks to do my job, as you kind of imagine, and some of them are less than exciting. So I always like to take my textbooks to, you know, or at least I did before Corona, to a coffee shop, you know, in a far part of town, because there's a little bit of novelty in the environment. I haven't been there before. I'll find someplace new. I'll find someplace novel. And I'll just do the work there simply because the extra novelty, oh, new environment, little, little bit of unpredictability, gets a little bit of dopamine going into my system. And then when I start reading the book, my attention is heightened. And as soon as I start connecting 
the neuroscience ideas that I'm learning to older ideas that I've already had, right? That experience of insight that's even more dopamine and pretty soon I'm in flow. And one of the great benefits of flow is it massively amplifies learning. In studies by the US Defense Department on soldiers in flow, they found soldiers in flow can learn 240% faster. And other people have redone those studies and they found uh, you can, by putting people into flow, you can cut the time in certain activities, not across the board, but in certain activities uh, between novice and expert in half. So 50% less time to go from novice to expert. That's incredible. So in your case, in your example, when going out into a coffee shop to read a book, can we say that coffee shop is the trigger? No, you could say that novelty Novel. and unpredictability right. in, I understand that in that particular case. So it's a novelty. So it's novelty. Yeah. And you can, I mean, where you can have a novel environment, the coffee shop, right? I'll give you another example from, a, from an organization. So Steve Jobs, when he built Pixar, um, wanted, he wanted more complexity and predictability in the environment um, because he wanted employees bumping into each other. His, his concern was, hey, marketing stays over here. Sale automation stays over here. Management stays over here. Nobody's talking to one another. Yeah, right? yeah. So he built, when he built Pixar, I don't, I, I, I've heard two different stories. I've heard this is true or I've heard they didn't let him do this in the end, but he wanted to. I don't actually know which is true, but I, I've heard it is true. He built one bathroom. On the other side of the, the of the meeting room on, on the cafeteria, so everybody would have to walk through the cafeteria, bump into each other, trade ideas, have insights, novelty, complexity, unpredictability, more flow, and you know one of the things again, flow massively amplifies learning. It also massively amplifies creativity and innovation. Um, it depends on who did the studies. We've done studies that show. The increases can somehow be as high as 700%. There was really cool work done, University of Sydney that saw 500%. Teresa Modley at Harvard figured out that that heightened creativity will last a day, maybe two, way longer than the flow state. So a very powerful creative tool as well. And that's what Steve Jobs was trying to get at. And, you know, it clearly, something clearly worked because Pixar keeps winning those Oscars. It's interesting that when I worked as a consultant, uh, I worked as a consultant, and I have an assignment at some tractor-making um, tractor plants, and uh, the marketing department hated sales department with all their hearts. I mean, the, everybody thought that you know they are getting more and less work and more money, and, uh, and what we've done, we created a smoking room because everybody smoked at that time. Uh, only one smoking room for these two departments, we put them together because before they wanted to put them as far away and that actually didn't help because the, actually when you know your enemy, when you know someone, it's easy, you can, you know, associate yourself with someone who smokes the same cigarette, so, you know. Yeah. And so putting them in one room actually created a, a sort of synergy and the problem was partly resolved. So that's interesting that I didn't know that <laughs> actually I was doing that earlier than Steve Jobs, I think. <laughs> well, what is so, Two, th two points off that because you touch on something really critical. So first of all, when I say peak human performance, um, I don't mean anything more than getting your biology to work for you rather than against you, right? There's nothing else going on. That's all we mean by peak human performance is getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. My second point is most peak performers end up going in this direction, right? Like when we, we train... As a general rule, we train like top executives, right? Or top athletes or US Special Forces, really top 5%, 10%. We, we can train everybody, but the bulk of our business, um, as I said, we train about 1,000 people among 1,200 people. I would say 80% of them are top executives. 50% of what we're teaching them isn't brand new to them. Mm -hmm. They just had no idea why they were doing it or how to do it exactly or how it worked, right? This happens across the board, right? Everybody has big gaps in their armor because there's a lot to know, but as a general rule, most people have your experience. If you're a peak performer, you've gotten to the top of a field, there's only one way to do it. There's just your biology. So yeah, of course you're doing this sort of stuff because mm. it works, right? Interesting. But uh, still just to make it clear for myself. So if there are certain triggers like novelty or et cetera, which, which leads to that stage. So it's basically- well, let me, Let's talk about some other ones that aren't like that. So let's talk about something really simple where I start. 
complete concentration is a flow trigger. Right. Human body is hardwired for 90 minutes of complete, con like we're, we're built to focus for 90 to 120 minute periods. So the first thing I do when I work with companies is I walk in and, and I say, look, people, if you can't put a sign on your door that says, fuck off, I'm flowing, you can't do this work, right? We teach people to start their day with 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted con concentration, right? Eat your ugly frog first, hardest task first. Start with the thing that's going to give you the biggest win for the day. Distraction management, right? So cell phone off, smart email messages, texts, alerts, right? Have your conversations ahead of time. So if your kids are at home with COVID, you talk to them and say, look, you know, we're gonna, one of the great things about flow is it massively amplifies productivity. Mm -hmm. McKinsey, the business consultancy, did a study of top executives. They spent 10 years talking to top executives around the world. And on average, they reported being 500% more productive in flow. That's insane. Right, that's just a huge, a huge boost in productivity. So you end up like you got to have your conversations ahead of time with this stuff around complete concentration. But you know what? It's what I always tell people is: look, yeah, it's gonna. It's ninety minutes in the morning is a lot of time to ask people for, but you end up getting a ton of time back because you're so damn productive and flow. So you actually like. I always kids are one thing spouses are really you know what i mean if you're suddenly disappearing for 90 minute blocks and you weren't doing that before exactly. your, yeah, your wife or husband is going to start freaking out and what i always say is look you'll you'll get the time back give me this you're going to get more of me later and you'll like me more mm -hmm. i'll be a you know i'll be in a better headspace um so some of it's really simple right complete concentration start there um some of it is stuff that i'm sure you're familiar with like clear goals are a flow trigger they lower cognitive load. When we know what to focus on, I know what I'm doing now, I know how to win, I know what success looks like, and I know exactly what I'm gonna do next, my attention stays locked in the present. It lowers cognitive load, and I stay focused. So go, we, we tell people, go into a 90-minute block, right? Mm -hmm. Have clear goals built around it. And clear goals, by the way, these are not like high hard goals or you know there are three levels of goal setting there's your massively transforming purpose which is your life's mission statement which are high hard goals i, I want to write a book or go to college or start a business and then there's your clear goals what the hell you're doing today and the brain when i don't know if you, you this is going to be as much of a problem um in your part of the world as, as it is here when you say the word goals like clear goals to americans they don't hear clear they just hear goals and that's what they think about and that's the wrong emphasis the point here is clear you gotta know what what, what am i doing what am i doing next so like a clear goal for me is write 800 words in my new book you know this morning and maybe i say i want to write 800 words that leave my reader feeling happy or 800 words that leave my reader inspired or 800 words that scare the shit out of my whatever it is right just how long how do they feel i know what a win looks like great that's a clear goal so some of it's really simple stuff like that too. You'll notice none of these things are very sexy. They're not sexy. There's nothing, it, flow hacking sounds really sexy. It's one of the, the, the two hardest things I think to come to terms with about this work is one, applying it is not, like nothing sounds sexy. You don't get a pill to take, you don't get a whiz bang technology, you get clear goals and 90 minutes of whatever, you know what I mean? The second thing that's a little tricky is that peak performance always, as you probably know, works like compound interest, right? You won't get 1% better today, 1% better tomorrow. And, and for six to eight months, right. it just looks like micro gains. And then suddenly like a year from now, you've blasted out of a rocket ship and you can't believe how far you've gotten because it's, it's an exponential growth pattern, right? It's compound interest. Um, those things are hard for people. They're like, oh, I'm doing these things. They don't feel very sexy. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it will make a difference, right? I mean, certain things change immediately, including, you know, happiness and life satisfaction over well-being. Those are so tied to flow that that stuff starts to change immediately. But the big performance benefits, um, you know, I it's a little bit better today, a little bit better tomorrow, a little bit better the day off. And, and, you know, a year from now, people go, oh, my God, you know. It's like lean, you know, production of you know, Kaizen and then a little bit growth. And then, of course, it's, it, it looks and sounds like this uh, RAS, reticular activation system, where quite oh, a lot funny. of people are um, writing about that. When you set the so, goals, 
Is it something to the RAS that's deep in your brainstem, right? Like, and what the RAS really does is it gates information. It's part of the, right? It's like the thalamus, which sort of, it's a router for the brain, right? These two things route information. So, so flow, it's interesting that you asked about the reticular activating system. We, I've spent the past year and a half and we're going to publish this work in the next six months or so, really looking at, um, what happens during flow onset the first two seconds of flow is mm -hmm. sort of what we're looking at and it is predominantly deep brain structures i don't know if the reticular activating system is actually active or not um because we haven't uh gone that deep but I, I mostly predominantly um i work with a guy at ucla glenn fox um excuse me usc named glenn fox who trained under neuroscientist antonio damasio who's sort of like great at deep brain structures and things like that so he i'm finishing the paper this week or next week and then he's the next guy who sees it um and i'll find out so if you have me back in a couple of weeks i can tell you if the reticular activating system is actually involved or not right now we know it's the you know deep brain structures for sure um you know close close to there but i i don't i don't actually know if it gets down that deep probably does All right interesting yeah and it's, um, yeah, it's interesting when you said that if that frog and power of focus and, and these things really, it's like a, a combining all these small bits and pieces into something which can be mastered and which can be implemented with these certain triggers. And this is, I think, can it be done with technology? For example, if you, I, I, I listened to one of your talks and then you said that if uh, people when people meditate and if you want to become a fantastic you know at um, mindfulness uh, you know at the Tao level then you have to have like i don't know thirty thousand hours of meditation now with the technology can you put something on your head like for a couple of hours and have the same reactions in your brain as through this um, very so, big training The answer is a little more comp. The answer is, is no, not yet. And I'll and let me explain why. Um, flow is more complicated than most meditation mindfulness practices. There are certain mindfulness practices, for example, uh, both Jewish mysticism, so Kabbalistic mysticism, and to complicated Tibetan Buddhism, they use visualization systems that go along in their meditations. There's it's really complicated, like. In, in, in Kabbalistic uh, mysticism, you'll visualize seven, eight, 10, 12 sided dyes with different Hebrew letters on each side mm -hmm. and they mutate and they change. It's super complicated. Tibetan Buddhism is the same kind of systems. When you're doing that stuff, there's some proof that those kinds of things can produce flow. But as a general rule, what happens in the brain and mindfulness, mindfulness is great training for flow. So we teach people how to, you know, how to use respiration. It's the best, you know, access point we have to our nervous system. You can, you know, you can get really dangerous just with some, some good breath work training and mindfulness training, but it's not flow. We have technologies that are good at mindfulness. We are trying to build a biophysical based flow detector. So something that can actually, we've got psychological questionnaires. We have determined a, a large portion of what happens in the brain and flow, but there's no one detector that can measure all those things at once. Mm -hmm. But the technology is moving very, very quickly and we're trying to build one. Um, and we think we'll be there within a couple of years. And we're not the only ones. Uh, there's a guy on my board, Adam Ghazali, who's a friend of mine, who's also a competitor in this thing. He's at the University of San Francisco in California. He's building a version of this. There's an Israeli company that's got a very, you know, so there's some people who are poking at this, but right now, the problem is there are a lot of people who want to sell you some stuff, right? So they'll say, oh, I've got this brainwave headset. It measures EEG and we've measured flow and blow. Well, flow is much more than brainwaves. Mm. It's brainwaves and changes in functional connectivity and neural anatomy and network dynamics and neurochemistry and blah, blah, blah. So like, yeah, okay, your brainwaves are the same, but that is a very small picture and you're lying to your customers, really. So I always say, if somebody tells you they've got a device that can put you into flow, they're lying at this point. Mm -hmm. um, if five years from now, that may be a different story, but right now it's not, we're not yet there. But there's a lot of stuff that can help you get there, right? We do know, for example, that brain waves are at the alpha theta borderline in flow. 
And you can use neural feedback devices to train your brain to the alpha theta borderline. In fact, one of us, uh, so if our coaches are all PhD psychologists or neuroscientists, one of them, Dr. Chris Bertram, works with, uh, four, he's the flow coach for the Canadian Olympic snowboard team, the Canadian Olympic golf team, tennis team, and two other teams. He has a, uh, and we, we use this, he built a headset with a single electrode sitting in the middle. Of, so it's very weak, right? It's just one literally electrode but it measures activity in the prefrontal cortex and he will, for the snowboarders, right? We always say, don't you, risk can be a flow trigger, but you're a moron if you use risk as a flow trigger. Why would you do something dumb and dangerous to get it? You wanna wait till you're in a peak state of performance, then do the dumber and dangerous thing, right? It doesn't make sense to do it the other way. So he uses this headset to get his athletes to the, to get their brain waves right to the edge of flow before they go into the half pipe. And then he, how they ride the half pipe is built on flow triggers, but it helps. So you can use the technology to sort of push you closer to the edge of the state, but then you have to do, do a couple more things as well. You're still gonna have to get more dopamine into the system, basically. We don't have a technology, thank God, unless you're talking about deep brain stimulators for people who have Parkinson's, right? There's, there's not a technology other, I mean, social media, right? There's a dopamine joystick, but. Yeah, it's interesting because usually when you are in the flow state, then you perform between really at the age and those people you mentioned, those, you know, you know, snowboard guy who is doing it from crazy mountains and then the sort of waivers, you know, this um, uh, surfers, you know, who are absolutely doing crazy things. So they do that at the age before being killed almost and being, but because they're in the flow that allows them to survive. Because if I would do it, you know, we wouldn't be able to have an interview like that. So, yeah, I'll tell you. So, I'll tell you where I, this is the one of the first flow secrets I ever learned. I'm a big skier and uh, <clears throat> I've skied my whole life. And there was a very famous skier in America in the 80s and 90s. His name was Glenn Flake. He used to have a giant mohawk um, and he was famous. He was all over the world. He was famous. Um, I know and, AD, AD the Eagle, you know. AD the Eagle. Okay, <laughs> close. Um, I know who AD the Eagle is. Um, we were uh, in Mount Hood in Oregon, and we were uh, going to ski this very dangerous chute, and there were cliffs on either side. You couldn't fall, you would die. And we were about to ski it, and Glenn backs up like 40 feet and then pulls in and jumps off this little mogul and does an airplane turn. So he jumps into the air, and he turns 180 degrees, and then he lands and skis the chute. And I skied it with him afterwards, and I was like, Glenn, what the heck are you doing, right? Like, why would you do something dumb and dangerous before we do something dumb and dangerous? Like, what are you thinking? And he said, no, 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 man. He said, something about being weightless at the top of that turn, it drives me into, he called it the zone. He said, it drives me into the zone, and when I land, I'm already performing my best, so it actually makes it safer to ski the chute. And I won't, nobody had ever told me that before. It was the first time I ever realized that like you could actually hack these states, right? There was ways to think about, about it. This was very early on in my career. And what we now know is weightlessness at the top of a turn. It's a form of kinesthetic body awareness that is it's unpredictability, it's novelty, and it's complexity in one. So we know when athletes encounter weightlessness, that moment of weightlessness or weightedness or G-force in a turn, or uh, what's technically called polyaxial rotation, you and I know is spinning, right? We're gravity bound creatures. So anytime the body encounters any of those sensations, holy crap, a lot of novelty, a lot of unpredictability, a lot of right risk, a lot of dopamine, instant flow state. Not instant flow state, you need some other stuff going on, but it helps you a lot. Interesting, those who were jumping, you know, this parachute jumping, I mean, they experience something like that because when- By the way, I gotta, I, I, you, I gotta tell you something. You don't even have to be jumping. I have had to go, I've been like traveling other countries where jet lag, tired, it's before a speech. I gotta go in and you know, talk to 10,000 people or whatever and I'm exhausted because I haven't slept for three days. Um, you know, what happens when you go to Estonia and it's you know, 12 hours off of my normal life um, and I love Estonia. Um, but you're always exhausted when you're there. 
but I will like, I'll walk to it while we walk into the speech and you know, if there's nobody around, they can see me, I will jump up in the air and spin a 360 and land again, just as I'm walking down the hallway, because that- You probably would regret they invited you as a speaker. It does the same thing. It just does the same thing. And I'm like, you know, I land and I'm like, okay, dopamine, I'm awake. Let's go do this thing. You know, it's stupid, but it works. Interesting. And the most exciting thing is that you don't explain it in, you know, your people in advance that you're going to do that. So they... <laughs> no, I just scare the shit out of the, the, the organizers, the events organizers. Like, what's wrong with the Cutler guy? <laughs> right. And, and in, in another thing, which, again, in relation to this flow thing, and um, it's de dealing basically with the current stress. I mean, I know that probably you asked that question before. I mean, coronavirus it, nowadays, or maybe stress in general, how being in the state, you know, what, what do you have to do? Oh, that's a great question. To so, um, when you move into flow, uh, so stress, when you talk about stress, you're really talking about cortisol, norepinephrine, uh, activity in a couple parts of the brain, predominantly the amygdala, uh, a couple other things. So when we move into fear, flow. Fear as well, yeah. So fear as emotion. I don't know the yeah. chemical behind it, but it's a fear. fear the amygdala is where, what generates anxiety. I mean, it generates a lot of emotions, but anxiety, you know, it'll, it'll produce anxiety. Um, anyways, that part of the brain shuts off and all the stress hormones are actually flushed out of our system. Right before you move into flow, uh, there's a nitric oxide gets released. It's a gaseous signal and molecules sort of everywhere in the body. It's a neuro, it's one of the only gaseous neuromodulators. Um, and it pushes all the stress hormones out of your system. Um, so I'll give you an example. You've experienced this when you exercise about 20, 25 minutes into exercise. You so, it's like when your body finally relaxes and gets quiet upstairs, that's nitric oxide pushing all the stress hormones out of your system and replacing them with some of the feel good chemicals that start showing up in flow. So it's really great for stress. Um, in fact, we believe if you have a, uh, if you have regular access to flow once or twice, a week and uh you have an active recovery protocol meaning you get eight hours of sleep a night and then you do something else you do restorative yoga or you do some breath work meditation or you know you get a body work or epsom salt baths or i my to personal get your energy right to get well, you energy. do something that is active recovery protocol not just i don't mean you drink you have a drink and, and watch television that's not an act that's not recovery right i mean like you sleep eight hours a night and you get a massage, you just get no sauna. Um, I'm a big, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a big sauna fan. Um, that's my active recovery protocol. But anyways, what we found is if you have an active recovery protocol and uh, you're getting into flow on a regular basis, it is, it's not impossible. There's, there's one condition that this is not true in, but as a general rule, it's very difficult to get burned out. So it's not just, not only does it reduce stress, but um, it can it can be pro prophylactically protective against burnout, um, unless you're you, you know if you've got if you like work for one of those passive aggressive bosses who's always moving the goalposts, no, that you're going to burn out. Like there's nothing you know you work for a psychopath, quit, get a better job, right? Like you can't you can't that will burn you out. There's no way around that one. It's easy, but uh, but if um, if um, you you kind of you get this flow thing and and then you probably your immune system benefits as well so they yeah, are so this is, to get the you know disease it uh this was one of the earliest questions i started investigating back in the in the late 1990s uh and um yeah we we know that all the neurochemicals that show up and flow they boost massively uh, boost your immune system they obviously reset your nervous system so for anybody uh i had lyme disease and i used flow to kind of cure me of it and i didn't understand how that was possible yeah, I've read about but my disease is a, a nervous system gone crazy right that's what it is autoimmune conditions are nervous system gone haywire so flow is particularly uh good at uh for autoimmune conditions and uh there's a bunch of new work um one of my colleagues just sent me um i think it was a textbook literally on uh flow's relationship to health benefits at this point so we're really starting to get a deeper look at that. I mean, it's not just flow, right? All the whole mind body connection stuff. There's great work coming out of meditation and, and, and whatnot. Um, flow is just another example of it. 
Right, because it's uh, it's interesting. I've read somewhere about American experiment. I don't know whether it was true or not, but so much depends on really of our brain when when uh, whether we get it or not. And the power of the brain is amazing. Somebody was supposed to be executed by shooting or something, uh, and uh, they said instead we can slash your wrists uh, and you'll die peacefully. You know, just losing blood. And the guy has agreed. As I mean, the story goes, and they started uh, pouring water like, you know, the blood was running out of his veins, and he died from heart attack. And there were no wrists splashed, etc. So, so he was really, he was blindfolded, and he felt that he has some, you know, warm water running his, his uh, you know, arms, and he felt weaker and weaker and weaker, and he died. So, and I think really the potential of our brain, and whether it's flow or something else, it's really incredible. Yeah, I've, I've done some work with uh, Joe Dispenza and uh, Joe Vitale, I don't know whether you, you know those names. And my, my uh, lady I interviewed recently was um, Lynn Mac, uh, McTaggart. And she is an uh, intention experiment, power of intention, when people can really through, not just individual. Those guys, yeah, I, those guys are very fringy to me. I don't, like, Joe Dispenza's neuroscience is terrible. He says things that are not true. Right. Um, and sometimes he says things that are so not true, they're actually dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he runs around telling people that small children should be producing delta wave brain waves. That children, this is a common Joe Dispenza thing. When kids are uh, first two years of their life, they produce delta, he says, and then they go into theta and then they go to beta and alpha. None of that's true. And if you take your child to a, a doctor and he's a little kid, he's producing alpha, a delta, he, your kid's got all autism. So some of those guys really, I don't trust their science. I don't, I don't think it's as rigorous as I, as I would like it to be. And um, it, it makes me uneasy. I, I know about Lynn's work um, and she was a very solid, uh, interesting reporter before she got into that work. Um, I don't, I, that's, I just deal with the neurobiology of flow. I don't like the spiritual stuff. They nearly destroyed flow research in America. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I just, I like the science. I like I like what I can what I, what can be proven in the laboratory and what I'm really comfortable with. Those guys are comfortable with more stuff than I am, perhaps. Also, it's interesting, yeah. So it's really like you're more on this kind of experiment side and etc. And then, yeah, I mean, I just like there's a lot of stuff that's super interesting that we can measure, right? They're you know they're making claims about quantum physics that are just not true. We don't know. They might be right, but we don't know. And they're talking about them as if they're right. And Joe Dispenza, um, I, like, I don't know anything about him. All I know is my p people in my network were listening to his stuff. So I got, I was like, okay, let's watch this guy. Like, what do I think? I knew nothing about him. And he just started saying some stuff that I was like, oh, wow, that, that's unusual. I didn't even know it was wrong. I was like, that's unusual. I've never heard anything like that. I should go look at some papers. How crazy. And when I started looking at the neuroscience, I mean, not only was he wrong, he was dead wrong. And some of the information was dangerous. And I was shocked. I was like, I don't understand how so many people can love this guy because you can't, like, I, I'm pretty, I, I like, you know, I, I like accurate science. I, I, I don't like people to make shit up. Yeah, I think commercially he's so successful partly because of simplifications. So it's like, you know, so it's easy to people for people to understand something which is uh, simple than uh, you know really thing which are really not that simple quite complicated and and uh, the, what you are describing you know the chemicals and mental thing which is happening in the body it's really it's it's uh, oh my god so I'll t we have so there's a great neuroscientist at Stanford named Robert Sapolsky um, I don't know if you're familiar with him I've, I've, is, I've read something yes but so he's got. He's got a class, his freshman year, I think it's the neuroscience of behavior, or maybe it's the biology of behavior, um, but he, it's 25 lectures. They're all online for free, but I, I think it's lecture 13. I can't remember, but it's the relationship between the brain and the endocrine system. And everybody works for me when they get hired, I make them watch this lecture. And the reason I make them watch this lecture is, it, I, I'm not even sure what the lecture is actually about other than the brain is so complicated, there's no way we can answer a lot of these questions. I mean, Sapolsky is one of the world's leading experts on behavior, and that particular lecture is about how the endocrine system can cause neurochemical receptors to grow and atrophy, and it's 
it's so complicated. It's why when people say they've got a substance that, you know, nutraceuticals, I'm like, no, you don't. Like, no, look at a map of the endocrine system. There's no way you can tell me this thing on the front end produces this thing on the back end because the science isn't there yet. Like we're just, it's too complicated to figure out what you're trying to prove at this point. Like it's a great idea, but we're just not there yet. And so I, I like the complexity. Um, I agree that you have to simplify it to teach the stuff and that can be very useful and can be very powerful for people, right? Joe Dispenda has really impacted a lot of people, right? And maybe for better, maybe for, like, I don't know anything about that, but like, um, simplifying it certainly is helpful. We have to do it. And I always, I try to present caveats all the time. I always tell people, look, I'm going to talk about five or six neurochemicals um, that are involved in flow, but like there's a couple hundred neurochemicals and there's probably way more than five. So I'm just, you can't say these are the five chemicals that cause flow. You can say, well, these are five chemicals we know show up during flow, but you know, it's, and um, it's, pres I don't know if it matters. I'm an asshole. I just try to be precise about this stuff. It's interesting because some people say that, you know, especially in the business, that if you cannot explain your idea to, I don't know, six years old child, then you don't understand it yourself, which sounds sexy, but it's not really true, I think, because, you know, there are things well, that cannot be explained. In the first I, I think that's true. I always tell people, I, I, I usually, as a general, if I'm talking to somebody and they're using a tremendous amount of big words to describe something, they're probably lying. Like as a general rule, when I like the smart, I know, I know, you know, as you know, smartest people in the world don't need a lot. They need precision language, but it's not a ton of it to communicate. Mm -hmm. But no, I mean, there are certain ideas that are, you know, there is neural dynamics, right? How populations of network of neurons work at a population level. Right, like we know individual neurons work one way, but populations of neurons work totally different the way people are, right? At individual, you're you, I'm me, put us together in a society, you get group. So trying to explain neural dynamics in is, you know, there's certain, once you get to certain levels of complexity, I don't think, maybe at some point when we actually really totally understand the full picture, maybe then we can simplify it. But when we're still learning things, for example, uh, quantum physics, right, which you hear a lot of new age spiritual people talk about. And I always laugh whenever somebody comes to me with a quantum thing, I always say, are you, well, are you talking about the Copenhagen interpretation? Or, you know, where are you, like that kind of thing. And I, I'm often joking and being, you know, a, a jerk about it. But my point is like, we're still, we don't know enough about this stuff to simplify yet. We ha you have to be complex about it when you're learning. Mm -hmm. knowledge is the ability to simplify it back down because oh we figured it the frick out and we can you know um sometimes it's useful sometimes it's not right and and uh, here you know it's, it's interesting maybe to to ask um what, well let me ask you that question i mean are you i know that you're optimistic about the future because i personally less optimistic about the future at least what i you know hear and artificial intelligence and the people are absorbed in these uh, you know devices and uh, missing the connection and etc 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 and there are a lot of already already some you know illnesses related to you know gadgets and the teenagers are you know doing less sport and less thinking and creativity goes down and they're supposed to go up, etc. So at the same, maybe it's my perception which which is wrong. It's one of the reasons I moved to a small town. I wanted to be sort of protected from this high tech, you know, uh, hype and and um, kind of uh, bring the children in a more sort of peaceful, traditional manner. Let's put it that way. What's your uh, perception? I mean, do you think that we really can make, a, you know, brain as such uh, in the future that we can actually create? We can have uh, you know, a person who will have um, endless life. Like if you, you know, manage to uh, the brain and, and then body can be developed. I, I are, are you asking about longevity research? Longevity or are you research. Or brain computer interface research or uploadable consciousness? Uh, or all three? All three, because I don't understand really the division between them. I know oh, okay. that so longevity, I mean, longevity, so let me, just so your listeners understand why I know anything about this. I, my core question has always been for my entire career, 
what does it take to do the impossible? I'm fascinated by those moments in history mm -hmm. when something that we thought was impossible becomes possible. So that's what I've spent my career doing. And sometimes this is the invention of, you know, sci it's when people turn sci-fi technologies, sci-fi ideas into science fact technologies. That's mm -hmm. Tomorrowland is my book about those moments. Mm -hmm. This could be building world-changing businesses. This could be breaking world records in sport, right? Doesn't matter. And usually whenever you see the impossible become possible, you see two things. You see people using flow to extend human capability, and you see people harnessing disruptive, accelerating technology. Mm -hmm. So half of my books, Abundance, Bold, Tomorrowland, Future is Faster Than You Think, Last Hang on Cyberspace, et cetera, are about accelerating disruptive technology. And the other half of my books are predominantly, except your, my novels, are predominantly about flow and human performance. So I work at the intersection of those two things. So on the technology side, which is where we're moving to now, um, I don't work in longevity, but my partner, Peter Diamandis, in, who I wrote three books with, has three different longevity companies and is deeply involved in this. I, what I like to say is there are nine not known causes of aging, and there are probably 20 to 30 serious players as companies that are pointed right now at every one of them. Progress is being made on all of them. Um, and this is, I mean, this is progress. We gained 30 years of lifespan over the in about we gained 30 years of lifespan over the 20th century. So right, technology does this. In fact, biotech is now moving so fast that every day we manage to stay alive, we gain five hours of life expectancy. Mm -hmm. No exercise required because the technology is moving so fast. Yeah, so longevity is is moving. That's right. Um, does it? You know what? I think I'm 53 right now. I am preparing to live into my late 90s for my retirement perspective. Right? Mm -hmm. Like we, I should be. If you look at the actuarial tables, I should be dead by about 86, 87. Um, at today's rate, but I, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow up. So I'm like, when I'm thinking about how much money do I need for retirement, I'm thinking, oh crap, I could live to a hundred, right? That's a good thing and a bad thing. But like, I think about it in that way. Could be longer, right? There are, um, Ray Kurzweil and Peter will say, if you can, if you can, you know, manage to stick around for the next 10 to 20 years, you can probably have another 40, 50 years. I could be wrong. Um, I taught, I tend to be a cautious optimist, right? I'm not a wild-eyed boy from Free Cloud, but I'm, I'm a cautious optimist. Um, when it comes to uh, human brain computer races, are we going to be able to uh, keep up with AI? That that stuff is moving very, very, very quickly. The research is is kind of incredible. I think some of the things that we, I think, you know, Elon Musk isn't doing anybody any good by making these crazy pronouncements about what his technology is going to do. Um, Elon manages to get his shit done always. Like he says he's going to do it, he does it. He has not really ever done anything on time. So like getting people all, you know what I mean? Like we're going to go here by 20. Okay, maybe let's see it, right? You Like, yes, you, you Tesla has taken over the world. You make great electric cars. They're fantastic. Um, but usually a couple years after, you know, you say you're going to blah, blah, blah. So, you know, is, and brain computer interfaces, just as long the last component which was downloadable consciousness can i take my memories my life and put it into a computer you know I, the first time i reported on that was for the new york times as a journalist and i wrote about a project that was in england started in the early 1990s and their idea was oh we're going to record all this sensory input right now that was insane because our senses gather 11 million bits of information a second but that was their plan if they could gather all the sensory input then they could it was not the per per perfect idea, but they, the project went pretty far. It was called the Dreamcatcher Project. Um, and a lot of people have been working on it since. Um, I think that one's a little farther off, but I think we will, we will see some, some sort of version of something that does that within the century, right? But in the, but by the end of the century. So, you know, if you and I get to live long enough because of the longevity technology, maybe we'll get to download our, some facsimile of our consciousness, but I don't think it's going to convey eternal life or anything like that. But, you know, certainly the technology is moving. And um, when I, I want to just address the final thing you said, we've only got a few more minutes together. So, um, 
when Peter and I wrote Abundance. Abundance was a book about individuals harnessing exponentially accelerating technologies to sa solve planned global challenges, right? And it was amazing, right? Because for the first time ever, you're seeing people going after poverty or water shortages or healthcare shortages or stuff that like, you know, at 10, 15 years Let ago, me tell you, that was the most optimistic book I've ever read about the future. I think it was really like, wow, inspiring that it's not that bad, you know, because there are a lot of things that are very you can have, I mean, what the book was really about and the, we're, the book is not wrong about this. We have the technology right now to solve our grand level challenges. But Peter and I have always said, hey, you just having the technology doesn't get it done, right? Like it's still going to require the largest cooperative effort in history global cooperation and it's i don't think it's just cooperation you need people in flow cooperate right cooperation collaboration communication all get massively amplified in flow you need people in flow collaborating to, to pull this off so yes i'm massively optimistic but i also think it's sort of like abundance or bust either we figure this out or we're going to have real problems mm. um certain things you know species die off climate change right these are problems we have to solve and abundance itself you know we compared to the last century we live abundance in life oh but we are not that happy compared to 100 years ago so that's something again it's something which is uh, uh, not very tangible but um, it's important how do you know we're not that happy compared to 100 years ago that's a good ago? point yeah because I when always, we, I, I'm well read, you know, I've read all the classics, I think, you know, Russian and, and, and Western and, and there are quite a lot of uh, pessimism, actually, quite, yeah, that, that's something which is true. I mean, very neurotically, you know, written. And when sometimes we say to children, you have to read, but when, what do you read? You know, it's again, it's, it's, it's another thing, but that's another question. So you're right. I mean, we tend to believe I, I, that I, it's, it's uh, not... I'm not sure, I'm, I think we notice more now, right? We're very, we have terms for it. Um, think about how broad our psychological vocabulary has become over the past hundred years. Um, so now we can be very, very, I've got anxiety, not depression, right? And you've got ADHD and blah, so we're very, very precise about our diagnoses and whatever. I'm not, I'm, A, I'm not convinced we're less happy. Um, and B, I'm not, happiness is how you feel right here, right now in this moment. I'm less interested in it. Flow does not really amplify happiness. What it does is it amplifies life satisfaction, well-being, meaning, purpose. They're different things, right? Happiness is how do you feel right here, right now? Most of that's genetic or early childhood environment, right? You can... Act, uh, we, we know uh, repeated access to flow will actually kind of move you up a little bit. But Dan Harris wasn't wrong. You can be about 10% happier. That's about the wiggle room you have. Mm -hmm. um, there's no cap on life satisfaction, well-being, contentment, meaning, purpose, right? And as a general rule, we always say that people who have a lot of flow don't necessarily have more happiness because flow requires you to use your skills to the utmost. Mm -hmm. Right, so usually stretching yourself and pushing really hard. That's that a big component of happiness when you feel that you're at your best, big performer, you feel satisfaction, you've done it. Whoa, and that's all that feels amazing, but in the moment, you're, you're usually like I always say, like when I'm skiing and I'm in flow, it's amazing, but when I'm on, ch in, on the chairlift, like often my legs are hurting so much right because they're filled with lactic acid and then i start skiing and i'm back in flow and i don't notice because it disappears mm -hmm. but like it's actually i feel awful i mean right but i just don't notice it so like it's it flows funny that way but the yes it will make you feel happier but i i'm suspicious of our obsession with happiness yeah. um because it doesn't i look back on my life and and i'm sure you do the same the times, the things that are the most rewarding for me, the things I'm proudest of, they're the things I suffered for, right? They're books where I was just, you know, struggling with the language for months and months and months and months and months, and months or, you know, achievements that were really hard. Was I really happy along the way? No. 
am I totally content and satisfied? Does my life have deep meaning and has the impact I've had in the world massively gone up as a result? Yes. So I'm not, yes, you can get happier with this stuff. I'm just, I'm a little suspicious of it. You know what I, I'm just not Very sure. Here. It's the target you really want all the time. Yes, and, but some people say that yes, happiness is when you go through unhappiness. So you cannot compare, if you're always happy, you know, how do you know that you're happy? <laughs> so it must well, that's be- the other, Yeah, that's the other thing. For sure, we always tell this, first of all, you can't live in a flow state, right? Because it's a cycle. So about once, about once a month, now that COVID has started, this doesn't happen as much. Once a month, somebody will come up to me and they'll be like, oh my God, Stephen, I'm in flow all the time. You got to study me. And I used to like, sort of be like, you know, I didn't know what to do. And now I just tell them the truth. And I'm like, yeah, we have a word for that. We call that schizophrenia. <laughs> right? you, know, you don't live in flow. It's not a good thing. And you don't want to either. I meet all these you know, you can get bliss junkies, flow junkies, where they don't want to do anything unless it feels flowy. Again, bad attitude, stupid attitude. You're addicted to these feel-good neurochemicals, um, and that's that's going to actually block flow. Um, but you don't want to be in flow all the time because, as you pointed out, the information is in the contrast, right? Here's this peak performance state that feels amazing, and here's my normal life. If everything felt like that, you mm. know, we're the, the most common, the brain works on something known as repetition suppression. This is the idea, there's different terms in different psychologists call it, uh, what do they call it? Laden inhibition, neuroscientists call it repetition suppression. The neurodynamicists, they got another different word for it. All it means is like the first time you walk past, I don't know, red square for the first time right and you, you see the architecture it's amazing it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen you pay so much attention to it. the second time you pay a little less attention the fifth or sixth time it's just the thing in the peripheral vision as you go to starbucks to get your coffee right that's repetition suppression your brain tunes out stuff that it's seen before this is the most this allows brains to work you have to think about how neurons work with electricity they get excited if they just got excited all the time your brain, that's an epileptic fit, right? You would literally short circuit. So everything's designed to make us not, like we habituate to everything. It's how, at every level of our, of our being, this is great for performance, right? Because you can get used to working at a much harder level and not notice it, mm -hmm. right? But um, it also causes problems. But as you pointed out, the information is the difference. Um, all right, I've got time for one more question. Happy to come back and chat with you more at a later date, but I've got one more time. Yeah, no, but um, more my more question would be, will you have uh, another interview with me? Because I, it's really fascinating. I really enjoyed it very much. And I think the uh, you know, level of knowledge, and you are a journalist, you are not neuroscientist, but uh, I think you've really done so much work on mastering the, the, you know, the knowledge and you're a front runner in a way in a lot of stuff like that. You know? Well, so, I mean, it's interesting because I am not a neuroscientist. Um, and I, I always tell people two things. If you think the scientific review process is hard, try being an actual journalist, try like a real job, not, and maybe now it's a little different, but like, I always tell this story. There was a, I wrote a story for the Atlantic monthly once and I wrote it with two people. I wrote it with, uh, Dr. Andrew Hessel, who's the world's leading expert on synthetic biology. He now runs the Human Genome Right Project. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Goodman, who's the world's leading expert on cybersecurity. And we wrote a story on the dangers of synthetic biology for uh, terrorism, things like that. Mm -hmm. They convened in a panel of experts that included George Church, who, so Andrew Hessel's the world's second leading expert on synthetic biology. George Church is the number one and then they there were like 17 different scientists and they argued for six months about whether or not we could publish this paper when i do a peer reviewer neuroscience paper which i do i get three or four reviewers like the journalism process is so much more rigorous if edit when done right often than the science process first of all um and second of all because i'm not a neuroscientist and all everybody i work with is a neuroscientist or a phd psychologist the quality of my work has to be better 
right? Because I'm playing, like I'm a, I'm a pretender to the right. throne. Yeah. I'm not actually a neuroscientist. And I work with people who are, you know what I mean? My, the people I work with are the best in the world. So I have to, I always think I have to work harder than they do to do the same job. Um, and I think that one of the reasons maybe I'm sort of become the world's leading expert. And also I'm the world's leading expert because most of the people who did this work for so many years, this is changing now, they were psychologists. They didn't really care. They would do some neuro work, but it wasn't, this is changing. And a lot of the, there's so there's great teams in Europe at the Karolinska Institute, um, some folks in Germany who have really started doing great neuro work. And there's great neuro work here in the States now, but none when I was doing it. And I just, I, I, the psychology is squishy, right? When you say I've got anxiety, I go, well, what the f hell is that, right? But when you say, okay, you're amygdala, blah, 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 you know, it's down to the level of receptors. And the only reason I care, I'm not trying to be a dick, I'm trying to be practical, right? I don't like, I don't like psychology, I don't want to talk about it, I want more of it. Mm -hmm. Peak performance, how do we get more of it? The neuroscience gives me mechanism mechanism makes me dangerous and the best example and this is the last thought i'll leave you with is if you go back into the 1990s when people were coming off the psychology and trying to train this stuff we weren't very good at it you can look into the papers there's lots of wow ah, sometimes if you've got really good performers you can get them a little bit better but it's very inconsistent we started to understand the neuroscience around 2010 11 12 13, at a really deep level um, when I started training this stuff using the neuroscience, um, uh, when we, uh, when we do it at the flow research collective, zero to dangerous is our, our general training. If you go to zero to dangerous.com, anybody can, anybody can take it. Um, it's an intensive program. It's not light, not cheap. You go through the PhD level psychologist as your, as your coach or neuroscientist, but we're seeing a 70 to 80% boost in flow on the back end. Right. It doesn't, let, let, that's a fancy number, so let me caveat that. Not everybody stays up there. Depends, it doesn't depend on flow. Flow is actually remarkably easy to teach with the biology. It depends on other skills that you need to support flow. Uh, flow will massively increase motivation and grit, but you need some motivation and grit to do this work, mm -hmm. right? Other stuff, you have to, flow requires you to use your skills at your utmost. So if you don't know how to learn, if you're not a good learner, well, you're going to be able to not keep up with what flow makes possible. So there's other stuff that will hurt you. We can, we train people in that stuff as well. We don't do it in our six week course because you can't do it that fast. It's more stuff going on, but really trainable stuff at this point, you know, I, we, the, um, so that's the thought I'll leave you with, which is, yeah, it's, um, you can do a lot. What I should tell you is, uh, art and possible comes out, uh, in January and, uh, so have me back around then and we can talk about the new book and, and what's, what's that, what's in there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. So I really appreciate your time. And uh, I think for a lot of viewers that will, if you don't mind, I'll put a link to your, this from zero to dangerous. Yeah, for uh, sure. Courses. I think it's eight week course and uh, then people will probably consider it. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I really, really do hope, I mean, one thing which Zoom cannot do is just, you know, handshake, a hug, I really, I'm a very emotional guy and I really miss it. And the, all my speakers, you know, when we have live events, yes, I mean, there is a more, more productivity through Zoom, but the energy, the eyes, you know, the closing. Yeah, you know, I, so I, I will tell you, I'm kind of an extreme introvert. And it's not that I don't like introvert. Being an introvert. I really, I like spending 14, 15 hours a day alone right? My wife, my dogs, nobody else. I live in the middle of nowhere like you. I like it in public, but even now I do miss the fun. I do miss making friends and I do miss um, just getting to share ideas. You know what I mean? You have a couple, couple of cocktails, the conversation goes in a weird direction and suddenly you're really learning something that that doesn't, you know, it sometimes happens on Zoom, but it's not, you know. So it's not, there is no, not much small talk which actually sometimes, you know, gets into something bigger uh, on the Zoom. Yeah, I'm not, I've never been great at small talk. I just don't know how to do it. I'm a little bit too on the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, too modest. I think you, you, you're, you're a wonderful communicator and uh, really, it, and for you being an introvert, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, but. Oh, no, I, I really, I really am an introvert. I'm good at being an extrovert and I, and I, and I like it, but uh, so I'm, what I really am is a creative and 
this was Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work. He's the one who figured out creatives are always both and, mm -hmm. um, introverted and extroverted. It's because of how the brains work. So most people are either or. You're mm -hmm. either an introvert, you're an extrovert, you're either you know really naive or really you know intelligent. Creatives are always both and, right? Like you can be really conservative. You want to conserve the tradition of writing. Right. And you can want to be really rebellious. You want to break certain rules, right? You want to be introverted, extroverted. So I'm just a typical creative, but I really, like, I see, I get, you know, three days in a, in a big city and I start freaking out and got to go hide. But your intra, uh, extrovertism is shown through your books. I think that's a channel of your, you know, kind of it other books. Is. So it goes really to public and it's fantastic books. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Great hanging with you. Yeah, have a lovely day and talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, so we just had a fantastic, I think, fantastic discussion with one of the leading experts on peak performance. Fantastic writer, you know, best-selling uh, author. Uh, the, can you imagine that pre-awards to his books were written by Bill Clinton, um, Ray Kurzweil, I mean, probably the best futurologist ever, you know, existed. Then uh, Peter um, Diamandis, of course, I mean, he's co-author and, and a very, very good friend. So really, really interesting uh, front-running science. Um, and I really I hope uh, that you enjoyed, you know, this interview. We're going to have a next one, as uh, you, could, you could hear in January, when his uh, next book is out. And the book is called The Art of Impossible. So it's very similar to what he is doing, but that would be next book and uh, I'm sure next best setting book. Uh, so subscribe to my channel. Thank you for viewing and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.